Welcome to this LEX 18 Digital Conversation. I'm Dia Davidson. Politics, commerce, education, health care, all hot button issues here in Kentucky. And leading the way and the discussion is Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, one of the leading organizations of its kind in the nation, and its members are faced with a number of issues that will be brought up during the new legislative session. Here to talk about some of the major areas that will be addressed is Dave Atkinson. He's president and CEO of the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. Dave, it's always good to see you. Glad to be here, Dia. Thank you. Well, business and commerce and health care and all of the above. It's a lot going on here in our state and the chamber seems to ha have its finger sort of all over the place on that. Uh, we're involved in quite a lot yeah. because most issues affect businesses one way or the other. Sure. Whether it's health care or taxation or the energy environment, you name it. Right. So we get involved in a lot of those and well, that's our business. Well, let's get into some of the key issues that are facing Kentucky. The governor, of course, had the State of the Commonwealth Address uh, on Thursday night and, and he, he seemed to be focused a lot on health care, abortion issue. He was talking a lot about taxation and school safety as some of the, the hot button issues for him. Where does, the, where does the chamber sort of fall in line with, say, the school safety issue? Yeah, we very much support that. We have several education bills that are moving in the legislative session right now. And school safety is certainly one of them. I think it's a concern for all of us who are parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so we support that very much. There are some issues that our chamber doesn't really get involved, I would call maybe the social issues typically, unless they involve the workplace mm -hmm. or employers. Right. Uh, we stick to issues that affect business and affect the business's ability to compete in the marketplace. And Kentucky's businesses are competing head and shoulders with everyone, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, you know, the economy is still growing. Right. Uh, there's a little uncertainty in the markets and whatnot, but by and large the economy is growing. Uh, so that's a good thing. Unemployment's at a low. I mean, I mean for decades it hasn't been this low. Uh, the challenge now is that businesses have trouble finding workers, mm. both in terms of quantity, just the number of people available, and the quality of the skills they bring to the table. So that's a big issue. Yeah, big issue indeed. The governor is up for re-election. And so do you find that people are looking to your uh, group to help and, and flesh out maybe um, whether it's strong to keep a Republican-based government, both houses and the government, governor's office, or are we looking for a change? Uh, well, first, the Kentucky Chamber is a nonpartisan organization. Mm -hmm. Our philosophy is we work with whoever you send to Frankfurt. Okay. Uh, so Democrats, Republicans, we try to create the best business environment that we can. There are some issues on which the Republicans have helped because of their particular philosophy, mm -hmm. others in which Democrats have been more uh, forward. Um, so we work in a two-party way. Clearly, business community has benefited recently I'd say in the last two or three years in terms of some of the things that have gotten through the legislature like right to work and repealing um, uh, prevailing wage, tax reform. Um, we put our agenda out there and ask them, what do you think? How will you help implement a pro-business, pro-jobs agenda in this state? It's not so much a matter if we look at their agenda and say, okay, well, let's support him on this, let's don't on that. We stay out of the political side of it and instead focus on the policies. But pension reform has been both something that educators and politicians are seem to, seeming to be somewhat at odds with. Yes. Uh, we started talking about the pension problem in 2006. That's, what, 13 years yeah. ago? Yeah. Um, and to Governor Bevin's credit, he was the first governor to come in and said, that is a major issue, we're going down the toilet, mm -hmm. we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. And he put money behind that. So even in his campaign, he came in, as I've said before, he came in swinging a, a two-by-four, right. uh, saying we've got to fix this problem. And by putting more money into it, it has helped the problem. It's not yet enough of a solution. We feel like there need to be some structural changes. But that's where it matters who we elect, and certainly on the pension issue, which is the fundamental financial issue for the Commonwealth of Kentucky, uh, there's been some progress made uh, during this particular administration. administration. Let's go into talking about right to work. This state is a right to work state. 
how can the chamber help to secure employees and employee rights within the workplace? Uh, well, the focus of right to work is that it basically says that an employee has the right to join a union or not join a mm -hmm. union. Uh, and it's symbolically, and it's, and it's an issue of symbolism more than right. anything else. Uh, our friends in labor unions take offense that you would pass right to work because they see it as an affront to their ability to organize. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the business community sees it as a very real symbol in terms of how business friendly the state is. Mm -hmm. I have been in a room before where I have lost a prospect for my home community of Owensboro back when I was mayor there and the business would say well we've decided to go to the Carolinas because they're right to work. Right. To business people it makes a difference and I've seen companies leave, excuse me, I've seen them not choose Kentucky, Kentucky right. because, because they sensed that another state was more business friendly. That's why it's real and that's why it's meaningful and I think we will benefit I'm confident we will benefit by more jobs because we're a right to work state. state. Exactly. Medical review. Expound on that a little bit. Right. Um, there are a lot of lawsuits that are filed in Kentucky. More concerning is the fact that for every time a jury awards a, a zillion dollars mm -hmm. to somebody for some injury or whatever, right. Every other company, every other employer in the state is more inclined to settle a lawsuit rather than having it go to court. Right. So there are a lot of settlements that are costing businesses a lot of money. And Kentucky is one of the uh, states that is most difficult in terms of its legal climate to do business, especially if you're a doctor, you're an OBGYN, you're a nurse practitioner, uh, you're a hospital, you're a nursing home. And so we fought for medical review panels. It passed the House and Senate was signed by the governor and it, of course it was overturned recently by the Supreme Court. Court right. The attempt there was to try to filter out frivolous lawsuits. Right. Somebody says, well, I'm mad at Joe Blow, I'm going to sue him and try to get into his, you know, his pockets. Right. Uh, we were trying to filter that out. It's working in some other states, but our Supreme Court decided that you could not impede the right of somebody to go to court. Right. We would argue you're not impeding them, you're setting up a filter to keep crazy stuff out. Right. But uh, we're going to have to go back and plan B on that one. And try to rework it so that it's fair for both business and for the patient right. client as My well. My mother is in a uh, hospital now. She's been in assisted living, probably be in a nursing home soon because of a recent incident. If something happened to her, I'd be the first one to say, I need a lawyer. Right. You know, I wanna, right. You know if, if, if there was a genuine harm. But the idea of just filing suits in order to settle the suit out of court to get a little money is very damaging to our business climate in Kentucky. And as a whole. Charter schools versus voucher system. You know, we, we bat around the, the term charter because it's a business. But what about the parent who has a child in private school who would like the voucher that would help them to offset costs? Right. Is there any push? Is there any support to help that? That's not currently on the table in a serious way in Frankfurt, and our chamber has not taken a position in favor of uh, vouchers for folks who are in private schools. We have taken a position on charter schools. We feel like that's an extra tool to have in the toolbox. And in areas where you have had consistently underperforming schools, mm -hmm. where they don't graduate their students and they don't give them that chance, um, charter schools can be a, an option. And they're not for-profit schools. Matter of fact, that's, uh, that was not authorized in Kentucky. It could be a, it could be a nonprofit group. Mm -hmm. It could be a church that says, we want to form a, a school in our neighborhood and forms a special nonprofit just to contract with the school board to run a school. So we favor charter schools. It wouldn't work in most places in Kentucky, especially in rural areas. But in the urban areas, we think it's an extra tool in the toolbox. Would it endanger the security of the financial security of the public schools to have that? Uh, no, because, and you can safeguard against that, plus your school district can terminate the uh, contract if the school or the nonprofit doesn't mm -hmm. fulfill their obligations and show progress in scores. No, the money would follow the student. And so th there could be safeguards in there. There would be safeguards in there to where the students going to a charter school would not get a disproportionate amount of money right. uh, uh, from what they would have been if they were in the regular public, public school would have been receiving. That's right. right. Okay. Well, good. 
Let's talk a little bit about infrastructure. We ride on the roads and the bridges and, and quite frankly, a lot of them are crumbling. As long as the roads are open and the bridges are open, we right. ride them. Right, exactly. <laughs> but they're crumbling. Right. What are we doing to help um, reinforce our roads and our infrastructure here in the state of Kentucky and keep pace and, and even uh, gain some of the federal funding that's out there still? Yeah. We have a problem in Kentucky, and actually I think most states have this same problem. Most of us are driving fuel e efficient cars compared to what we drove five years ago and ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Whether it's an SUV or whatever, it's they're more fuel efficient. Some people drive electric cars. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that the roads and infrastructure of our state, including airports and mass transit, the various forms of transportation, they're underwritten by the gas tax. So when you go to a fuel pump, you fill up your car, you're paying a gas tax that pays for road repairs and all that. Well, electric cars don't have to go to the gas mm -hmm. pump. So we need to modernize our formula so that everybody pays their share. Everybody that's using the highways should pay their share of what's basically a user fee. Right. So our road fund, bottom line, is not keeping up with the needs in Kentucky, not keeping up with the growth of our economy. So it's not just um, you and I wanting to, you and me wanting to get to work, it's a matter of UPS being able to get trucks to the Louisville airport to ship commerce all over the world. Right. So that's a top priority of the business community to modernize it. And yes, we do need to increase incrementally the, uh, the, the tax uh, on gasoline. But people are screaming, please don't tax us, don't overtax us. So where is the happy medium? Well, the current uh, tax on gasoline does, has not kept up even with inflation. And so uh, just to maintain what we have, we need a fund that um, keeps up with the cost of filling potholes and building a new bridge or a new off-ramp or a new taxiway to the runway at the airport. Um, so we are going to have to pay a, a share more. I think Tennessee, Ohio, and uh, Indiana have all now passed an increase in theirs. We're falling further behind. Right. Fortunately, Governor Bevin has come out and has kind of slammed his fist on the table and said, yeah, we've got to do this. We've got to step up and repair our infrastructure. Otherwise, it's going to really, it's already affecting commerce. Uh, you might remember um, in Louisville, the Sherman Minton Bridge, mm -hmm. which feeds I-64 and right. down, it was shut down for months. Yes. So can you imagine if you're UPS at the Louisville airport trying to get hundreds of trucks per day to fill up those planes, planes to go right. all over the world, and your major artery is cut off because of poor infrastructure, a poor bridge. That's right. So that's how important it is. It can be critical. Let's talk about jobs being brought here to this state. Are we seeing more corporations now coming and, and banging on the door trying to get into Kentucky? Uh, we are seeing a lot of activity. The state handles most of those in terms of the direct contact with those people. Mm -hmm. We're occasionally involved, too, at the Kentucky Chamber. But yeah, there's an uptick in the activity. Part of that is the economy. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that Kentucky has, over the last few years, passed pro-business legislation. And that gives you a certain re reputation uh, in, uh, the, among business decision makers in other parts of the country. I was with the governor. He uh, led a delegation, a national delegation, to India mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, we went over there. We called on a company that, uh, an Indian company in Delhi, India, that mm -hmm. has a plant in Kentucky. They have 135, 140 employees that's going gangbusters, they're operating at capacity. Right. They said we would double or triple that plant, but A, we can't find enough workers, and B, um, they have a problem with uh, getting visas. Huh. They need their Indian engineers to come in and train Kentuckians right. on how to do use the equipment and they can't get a visa to bring their engineers over just to train people. So are you going to Washington and saying, hey, help us out with this? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we have advocated a sensible immigration policy. Mm -hmm. Frankly, our, our economy in Kentucky can't grow at the level that all of us, I think, would agree we want it to grow, at least 3% a year. Right. It can't grow at that level without immigrants. Right. Uh, whether it's working in nursing homes or golf courses or landscaping or people coming in, high-tech people that are programming computers for our top corporations. Mm -hmm. We need a reasonable, that doesn't mean you open up the border and everybody gets to come in. Right. We're talking you, about legal immigration. Legal right. immigration, yes. right. Make, make it legal where companies can recruit. If there are South Korean software engineers who would love to come to America, 
why wouldn't we want them working in Kentucky? Oh, sure. you know? And even if they're students, to c bring these young minds into our, our right. uh, institutions of higher education, because then if they stay, then they'll grow and help grow our economy as well. When we were in India, we met with some of the top governmental officials, and I could tell as they talked about, you know, we've had a little bit of casual talk before our official meetings right. and all. Their idea of prestige and success was for their kids to go to the uh, go to the U.S. Right. for university. That's right. Uh, some of them to Harvard or Princeton, but mm -hmm. some of them to the University of Illinois or right. the University of Kentucky. Right. That's a big deal for comp uh, for for families in countries that are emerging from poverty. Poverty, you know? sure. Uh, so higher education is one of our selling points. So we need to open the gates to let people come and benefit from what we have to offer. What about retooling our people here or giving um, individuals, if it's two-year uh, community college, technical college training, four-year university, what can the business community do to help retool our people so we can grow our own folks? You know, two years ago, I decided we've got to make a commitment to workforce development. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, we've all noted the problem. Because coming out of the, even in the recession, there was a mismatch between available workers and the skills that were needed. Right. That was even during the recession when a lot of people were out of work. So you can imagine with the economy improving for the last eight or 10 years and baby boomers, folks my age, right. frankly, who are retiring at 10,000 per day in this country. Oh, wow. There are openings. And so you have basically a full labor market, uh, theoretically, uh, full employment and yet companies are screaming for more workers. So I hired a young woman, sharp as can be, a couple of years ago to create what we were calling our Kentucky Chamber Workforce Center. Right. It now has eight employees, mm -hmm. and they're stationed around the state putting together industries, for example, hospitals in a particular community, who compete with each other, but, say, uh, but we're there saying, let's work together. If you need, let's say in Louisville they decided, and I'll just make up a number, let's say, or let's use Lexington. Let's say they, the hospitals here got together and said, you know, we're going to need 3,000 nurses in the next five years or 10 years, whatever. They can do those projections, mm -hmm. you know, based upon what they've done. Then they ask them, says, all right, where are we going to get them? Are we going to Bluegrass Community College? Are we right. going to UK? Are we going to a private, like a Sullivan, Sullivan University? Right. Mm -hmm. Or are we going to bring people in from the Philippines right. as nurses? Right. What, you know, and they plan what we call talent pipelines. In other words, a pipeline of human talent that comes to you when you need them. Right. And so we're promoting the concept of talent pipeline management, TPM, right. all across the state. Not just for hospitals, but construction, IT, logistics, advanced manufacturing. Get companies that normally fight, for each, fight with each other over workers. To work Get them together. to work together and yeah. create those pipelines and manage those pipelines. And that seems like that's the, the bottom line of the chamber, getting all of these different yeah, things to just kind of all work right. together for one common good. Smoke-free schools and protecting smokers' rights. I'm not a smoker. So when I hear that smoke-free schools, yes, yes, yes. I'm not thinking of smoker rights. But you do have to think of everyone's rights, don't you? Uh, what are we doing in the state? Because you know, people still do smoke, right? And young people are choosing other options, like these these uh, electric cigarettes, the jewel cigarettes, and vaping, vaping, and things of this nature. What can the chamber do to help to protect the health and welfare, but yet protect the right within the tobacco sure. smoking? Sure, well? everybody should have the right for their own adult behavior and right. the responsibility for that behavior. Right. In the case of smoking, all of us are paying the expenses of that issue, though. Right. We all pay for it through our insurance premiums mm -hmm. and what we have to pay to get a hospital room, sure. uh, et cetera. So our membership, and we survey our members every year before we start a legislative session, our members are solidly like 10 to 1 in favor of a statewide smoking policy mm -hmm. uh, for public places. Lexington has it, Louisville has yes. it. About a third of Kentucky is covered by a current local ordinance. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we favor having that statewide, number one, so it would be consistent. You're sure. not wondering from county to county. Am I can doing I right in, or not? Exactly. Know, can right. I smoke in the Arby's or right. whatever? You <laughs> right, know. right. Uh, plus, it's public health. You know, we're way up there in the rankings, number one in youth smoking in the state. Yeah. Cancer ratings are very high. We've got to do something about that. This would be a reasonable step that most states have already taken. Um, in terms of the smoke free campuses you ask about, yeah. uh, about a I think about a third of 
our public campuses like high schools, you can still stand out behind the high school and smoke a cigarette right. or stand on, next to the football field and smoke a right cigarette during the game. Right. And this would make that um, illegal. Right. And frankly, it's a baby step. I mean, in our view, it's a no-brainer. Right. Why wouldn't your schools be smoke-free? So we hope to take that step now and hopefully could be more uh, comprehensive in the future. Exactly. There just seems to be so many different things that the chamber is working on. You've got a busy legislative session here in uh, 2019. What, what do you hope, what do you, what do you envision when you get to the end of the session yeah. that you'll be able to have sort of work through, maybe made another baby step towards, or maybe really achieve? Well, the pension problem still hangs over us. Right. It's a terrible, terrible financial burden on this state. Right. And it's a burden not just to Frankfurt, it's a burden on people who would like to see school teachers get a raise right. or students have access to summer school if they're falling behind. Mm -hmm. Our education system is being hurt because all the dollars that the economy can produce for Frankfurt, mm -hmm. for state government, mm -hmm is being sucked up, all those dollars are being sucked up by the pension problem. Mm -hmm. So it's a real deep, deep problem. Things got emotional last year yeah. between the legislators and uh, uh, the prince, uh, teachers, yeah. teachers marching in uh, the streets of Frankfurt. Uh, we would like, A, what is success? We'd like to see some movement, some structural movement in a reasonable way that protects the promises that we've made to our public employees, including teachers, mm -hmm. but also prepares us to the future for that for that system to be sustainable. Uh, secondly, some of these areas we've talked about, we'd like to see movement on the road fund, mm -hmm. uh, movement on smoke-free campuses, on school violence. Uh, we'd like to see the way principals are hired so that superintendents have more of a role in that yes. than they do right now. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things. Uh, the tax bill that was passed in 2018, a year ago, mm -hmm needs some tweaking. There were a few things that were unintended consequences like the tax on nonprofit. Yes. You, know, yes. you go to a school carnival and they're having to charge you six percent for the ticket. Exactly. You know? exactly. So that needs to be fixed. Everybody agrees that right. needs to be fixed. Sports gaming, we, we favor that. Right. I think there's a possibility for a bipartisan solution there that does protect our thoroughbred industry but also allows legal sports gaming. So those are some of the things that we're working on. All right. Well, busy session. Always good to see you. Thank Always you. good to see you guys out there, too. Thank you so much for watching this LEX18 Digital Conversation. For more on this and the other digital conversations that I do, just log on to lex18.com. Until next time, I'm Dia Davidson.